Hi. <laughs> See all that. Oh, there's Goldberg. Yeah. I'm this is here. Goldberg. I miss you guys. Hey, Sharon. Hey, Eric. Hi. <laughs> Do y'all see y'all see Mona here? I see Artie. Oh, hey, Artie. Artie. Arthur, I do. I'm Mona tonight. I see Jackie Wildman. I don't see her face, but I see her. <laughs> You'll see her face later. She's okay. just doing something. Oh, is that Jeff in the background, Marty? Is that Jeff behind you? Jeff is like, yeah. <laughs> he's got, he's got, he bolted. <laughs> okay. Oh, now he's got a mask on. <laughs> Jeff is Guillermo. Michael. Hey, Michael. Got a mask on. Hey, Katie. Hi, honey. <laughs> hey, David. What game are you watching? There's Mark. Uh, Michael. Eric. Joy. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you doing? Oh, David. Hey, Mark and Maddie. All right. <laughs> Hi, Robin. Hi, Andrea. Harlan. How are you doing, David? Hi, Jackie. Hey, Jin Jin. Hey, Mark. Hey, San Francisco again. Well, we're almost ready, guys. Hi, Betty Jo. Hi. How can you see him before me? Monty, I like that you dressed up. I don't know. You got that lousy computer from Jackie Walden, that's why. We're running. <laughs> You're not putting a jacket on. Oh. Get a tie next time. Hey! hey David's wife. Hey, David. Marty. I don't think you can. So cool. Marty? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. How do you like my new hairstyle? <laughs> Very uh, handsome. Harlan? Uh, what can I tell you? Harley, looking good, Harlan. Looking good. Well, that's... um. That wasn't what I asked for, but that's what I got. Right. I think you're mighty good looking, buddy. Yes, sir. That's Susan. Hello. Hi, Susan. Not you. I saw Susan a minute ago. Hi, Big Daddy. Hello, honey. Uh, hello. How you doing? Eileen and Aaron. Deb Silverthorne. Hi, Randy Cullen. Oh, Steve Walton. Tom. I see you there. Hey, Ray. Hey, Stacy. Yeah. Hi. Chris, look, he's looking here. Hello, Stacy. Hello. Hello. Hi, Grammy. Hey, you can see me? I can see you. I will move out of the side. <laughs> Jeff's coming back. Oh. Uh, okay. That's Sue Ellen? Uh, come on. Hey, Mary. Hi, Bonnie. Hi. How are you teach you how to change your name from Good, how are you? I like your background. Thank you. Mine's real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stacy, that's nice. Jackie, yours yours looks so real also. Hello, Underbergs in New York. Hi, Robbie. Turn it off mute. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Michael. Oh, Robin. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. No. I see some family. Who's in the back there? Robin. Hey, Rabbi. Hi. Hey. Oh, Is this only for family members or anybody can get on? <laughs> no, anybody. In okay. a minute, you'll, you'll be off, but for now, you're on. Hey, Martin. Hi, hey, buddy. Marty. I hear you. There he is. Hey. Lynn Repka. Hi, Hello, honey. How are you? Okay. Did you notice I put on a clean shirt for you? And a tie. On a tie. <laughs> Not going that far. <laughs> hey, Lynn, I've heard a lot about you. I don't know about it. I'm just kidding. And I know it was all good. All true and good. Yeah. Well, you were good. Thank you. Uh, hey, Motown. Hey, Marty. Hey, Steve and Joanne. Hey, Michael. Hi. Steve and Steve. Hi, Steve. Steve. Uh, hey, Rick. There's Dick. Hey, hey, Martin. How are you? 
I'm here. Hello. Oh my goodness. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I'm so glad you got a book and oh, yeah. and Max is waving at you. Hi, Hi Max. Are you on it? Hi Marty. Hello. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, Max. Hey there. Hey Marty. Hi Max. Hey. It's Max. Hey Marty. Max. Hey, Hi Debbie. Oh, there's Debbie. Raymond. Well, still. Raymond's at the Capitol. Hey, Marty. No, that's yep. the Naval Academy. I'm going to have to go. I didn't bathe. I didn't know this was going to be a, where you could see everybody. <laughs> hey, Alan, you'll pay later. I'm, I, I already bathed. No, I paid. Margetta. I didn't bathe. Right, right, right. Bath. Shower. I think, I think so. everybody's got to talk at once. Margetta. Yes. Hi, uh, honey. How you doing? Good. How are you, Steve? Great. Cool. Hello. You're, hey. you're going to meet see you. Hey, Ron Foxman. Hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, hey yeah. Ryan, will you wake me up when we start? <laughs> <laughs> it's 7.04, ladies. What do you want to do? All right, let's do it. Little panels. Neighbor? Okay, Ron, the show is on. It's your turn. Well, okay. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning tuning in. And uh, but before we get started, we're going to do a few housekeeping items. For the best viewing experience, we ask that you select Active Speaker View. And if you're on an iPad, it's uh, on the left side of your screen. And if you're on a desktop, it's on the top right hand corner. And uh, uh, we also ask that you hide your video by clicking on the video camera icon. Uh, it's at the top left of your iPad and the bottom <clears throat> left of your computer. Uh, there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions and you can ask by using the chat box and, and Marty will answer as many as possible. And finally, for the best internet connection, uh, please make sure you've closed all your other apps and programs on your device. And now uh, let's welcome Monty Hurst, Chairman of the JCC Board. Thanks so much, Ron. The Aaron Family JCC brings the community together and BookFest is one of those great ways it does. In fact, as we all know, BookFest is a tremendous way that we celebrate Jewish authors and we even get a chance to engage with them. And what a rare and fun and special occasion for this Jewish author on this evening to be one of our own in Uncle Marty Goldman. So before we move on with this, just wanna make sure we thank some people, uh, Rachel Weiss Crane, Adina Weinberg, Anna Miller Goodman, of course, Uncle Marty himself for authoring this, Steve Waldman, Jeff Seymour, and Ron Foxman. Uh, I think Uncle Marty said it best uh, in that uh, he's had a wonderful relationship with the J. And so to paraphrase him, the J has been the greatest influence in his adult life with the family values, the services to the community, and the programming. And Marty, you couldn't have said it better. Congratulations on your book and this wild and huge constellation of family and friends. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ron. Thanks so much. Thanks, Monty. And this evening, it's all about Marty, and it's all about his new book, The Three Year Weekend. Thanks for buying the book, and uh, special thanks from the Jay, because all the profits from your purchases are going to go straight to the Jay. Uh, I've known and been a friend of Martin for many years, and I, I can't wait to hear uh, Steve and Martin, but uh, I also can't resist telling a story, uh, a story that's not in the book. And if you know Marty, it's all about lunch. And this was lunch at Papa Do's. And it was a great lunch, and if you know Marty, you go to Papa Do's, and Marty orders, and he orders tons and tons of crawfish. We have a great lunch, 
I mean, we laugh and we eat crawfish and we suck their heads and eat all the, you know, the kosher crawfish. And uh, it was great fun. I go out to my car and uh, I go to put my key in the ignition and I look down at my right arm and there's all this red cayenne pepper stains up and down my arm. And, you know, guess who was sitting to my right? Martin. And uh, uh, I never laughed so hard in my life. And I guess the moral of the story is, uh, if you're eating something sloppy uh, and you're sitting next to Martin, you better kind of go through the car wash afterwards. Anyhow, um, I'll skip the formal introductions, which would include the many, many leadership positions that both uh, Marty and Steve have had in our community. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, uh, Monty, for your lovely introduction. I wanna thank everybody for being here. This is a very exciting time for us. Marty, thank you for asking me to host this evening. I think I'll never forgive you. Um, Martin uh, has a strong feeling for the community, strong feeling for the JCC, and we're so excited to be able to honor him this evening. Uh, Martin and I have known each other, I'm gonna say probably 65 years. Marty used to come to my house to play with my sister, Carol Jean, my sister Sherry, when I was much younger. And I fell in love with him then. We got to do business together. Martin and Susan became official members of the Walden family not too many years after that. And uh, we have just been uh, such great friends and he's such a wonderful mentor and guide for me and I'm so grateful for him. And we're gonna have a lot of fun tonight telling some stories. Um, like Ron, I cannot, I can't go forward without telling a Marty story too. You'll hear more about this later, but Marty and I used to fly to Houston a lot on Southwest. <clears throat> and uh, we had a client, we probably went once a month. And every time we went on the flight, I would sit at the window and Marty would sit on the aisle seat, but turn his body kind of like this. And you know, Marty's a big guy. So it was always uninviting for people to uh, get in that middle seat because Marty wanted to. And then what Marty would also do, he would hold up that barf bag right next to his mouth, just in case anybody was interested in asking to come in. So most of the time, Marty and I were able to sit one on each side with the middle seat to open. One time we got some guy that was a full flight and he sits in the middle. And so Marty and I always used to play games with each other on the flight. So I uh, look at Marty and I said to him, Martin, what's in that box? Martin looks over at me and says, well, those are my chemicals. Understand none of this is rehearsed. Those are my chemicals. I said, so since you're the executioner for the state of Texas, I would think that the chemicals you're going to be using are going to be at the prison in Huntsville that rather than you have to bring them on the plane, said, no, Steve, I've got to bring the chemicals with me on the plane. And so for the next 40 minutes, all we talked about was how Martin would weigh the inmate, and weigh, uh, you know, do all these calculations to determine. We had this guy convinced that Martin Goldman was the executioner of the state of Texas giving lethal infections injections, excuse me. Anyway, you can imagine how funny it was and how much fun we had doing that kind of stuff. Marty is always a bowl of laughs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Martin Goldman. Martin. You're muted. You're, I'm not muted, you're muted. Well, you're fine, keep talking. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, go out of here. Get out of here, Jeff. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you were gonna you were gonna ask me how I got to start on this book, but I was gonna tell you that uh, this has been so much fun, and of course you make it fun, Steve. And I got to tell you, Rochelle and Jeff and Ron, you guys have been such pals on this endeavor. But I got to go back to my buddy Dickie Fine, how it all started. 
so Dickie is my trainer and he comes to my house and we're sitting on, I'm sitting on my recumbent bike and I'm working away. And the, the more I work and the more stories we start telling about our childhood, he was six or seven years old and I was a little bit older and about how much time we had together. We played sports together. We laughed, we did tricks on one another, just things like that. And he said, you know, your, your dad's the one that saved my life. I said, how do you figure that? He says, remember, we used to box in your garage. I said, yeah. Well, your father told me, quit backing up from everybody and get it there and knock his head off. And he said, and I never backed up from anybody the rest of my life, and I owe it all to your daddy. So when he said to me that your friends should write stories about you and back and forth, I started thinking about that. That would be fun. When I did this, I just wanted it to be fun. Tell, tell funny stories about you, you tell f funny stories about me, and we have a good time. But the bottom line, the more I got into this, it became much more than that. So I called up Jackie Wallman, who's written more books than Carter's got liver pills. And I said, Jackie, what if people wrote stories about me and I didn't write a thing and, they just, and we published all those stories? She said, Martin, that would be a bestseller. She says, but don't do anything. I want you to get a hold of a guy named Chris Kelly. He worked for the Dallas Morning News, and he's the one that put the whole Holocaust Museum together. He was the guy. So I called up Chris Kelly, and he helped me get through this thing. And he did, did help me with the book, the artwork, and what a pleasure he was to work with. Martin, tell us about growing up in Dallas. Well, growing up in Dallas, first of all, you had to understand, I grew up in South Dallas on Colonial Avenue. My mother was president of the PTA in, at Colonial Elementary School, but growing up with Max and Gladys was just fun. We had the best time together as a family. My sister, Ida Ann, and I, just so many great relationships, but Max and Gladys were the key to it. A story about Max was, First of all, he came in the liquor business at Prohibition, so 1933 or so. And uh, he had a, a liquor store at the State Fair of Texas in 1936, which is the Texas Centennial. But Max couldn't make any money having a liquor store, although Julia Sheps owned the liquor store. So he and the guy that counted people coming into the fair or turned in the order, how many people would come into the fair that day, had a deal. And they worked a deal together they would always know how many people they was gonna write down. So my father would make money guessing closer than anybody else how many people would come into the fairgrounds. So he was a gambler and golf, whatever you want to play, any kind of card game, and he was really good at it. And then there was Gladys, who was an athlete. A lot of people don't realize this, but Gladys at 13 years old was the 100 yard dash champion for the Dallas park system at 13 years old. Her brothers were professional baseball players and college baseball players. They were great athletes, but Gladys was the true athlete. And in 1953 and 54, the YMCA gave Gladys the coach of the year for coaching our football team. Gladys could outrun, outthrow, and out, outkick anybody on our team, and we won at Hollander Stadium, the championship for the YMCA. And that was a real thrill for me to see my mother just, she got, she got it. And so uh, just so much fun growing up. And Rebbe Offsire at her unveiling said, I've never said this before, but if anybody's gonna rise from the grave, it's gonna be Gladys Goldman. So that's a little bit about our family. And anything else, Steve, on that end? No, thanks, Martin. Uh, Martin is going to be sharing some of his favorite stories that are in the book, some not in the book. I may share a few. But Martin, why don't we start with your family? Give us some good stories about Susan. Steve, we've only got about an hour here, so I really can't tell you that much about Susan. I can just share a few stories. But let me tell you something. People ask me all the time, how's Susan? I said, how do you think she is? She's married to me. I said, if you ever get reincarnated in life, you come back as Susan or her dog. It is a great life. Anyway, 
Susan and I, we have so much fun together because it's like seeing Johnny Carson in the evening time. We go to bed laughing. We're having a good time. And to this day, it's still that way. So one of the stories or two of the stories that I'm going to share with you is our, we were married two years and I was having some constipation and Susan says, well, I can solve that. Let me go to the drugstore and I'll get you some fleet liquid. And they had a thing called fleet liquid. You take a tablespoon or a teaspoon and you drink it and your constipation goes away. So sure enough, Susan gave it to me. She says, follow this recipe. I followed the recipe. She gave it to me and I couldn't get up from the going to the bathroom. I couldn't go to work the next day. So Susan, what did you do to me? She says, look, Susan, look, Susan, Ma Susan Martin. All I did was read the instructions on, on the bottle. It said two tablespoons per adult farm animal. <laughs> so that's Susan for adult farm animal. That's what she gave me the, uh, the, the, the two tablespoons full. Yeah. I was snoring at one time. She says I was snoring. And so she read in Dear Heloise that if you uh, have a uh, Estee Lauder perfume sprayed by somebody's nose, they stop snoring. I says, sounds good to me. I didn't know a thing about it. I go to sleep. She says I was snoring, but instead of spraying the Chanel or Estee Lauder, whatever it was by my nose, she sprayed it right up my nostrils. And I leap out of bed. I'm gasping for air. I mean, I'm, in, I'm struggling. She says, Estel, uh, she said, you weren't supposed to wake up. <laughs> Dear Halloween says, you weren't supposed to wake up. Neither, neither to say I didn't go to bed anymore that night uh, out of fear of that going on. So, Tell us about Stacy. Stacy, her favorite story is the, the dog mess park, and she's on right now. We had a big dog named Lady, about a 75 pound dog. And Stacy loves to tell the story. Every Saturday, Big Daddy, Daddy, would take us to the park with all three of the children. We'd go to the park and we'd play. But my chore was to go in the backyard with my shovel and a week's worth of Lady, I would throw it over the fence into the field. We had a big field behind our house. Everybody that remembers us on Yamini knew about the field. And I threw everything over the, uh, over the, over the fence. And then the kids are ready to go. Let's go to the park. We go out there and I forgot that I parked my Lincoln Town car in the field. And here is all that dog mess inside my windows that were open on my car. And the kids, <laughs> the kids were trying to get out of there. I said, no we got to clean my car and then we're going to get it detailed. But we ended up going to the park as promised, which was pretty much fun. Uh, my story about Robin, Robin's story that she wanted me to tell, um, we can't tell it. So you're gonna have to read the book to read the Robin story. But the, the thing that made her the happiest was Robin was homecoming queen I'm not saying she was the first homecoming queen in the Goldman family, but I'm pretty sure she was the first Jewish homecoming queen. So she was homecoming queen. She was class favorite. She was the head cheerleader. And when they announced her name, she said mm -hmm. the one you could see was my father beaming. He was so proud of me and so happy and said it made me so happy to see him happy. And so that always resonated with her and made me feel so good. When we go, when we later on, she is inducted into the National Honor Society. And who's doing the inducting? Well, one of my childhood friends, Tommy Dunning. Tommy and I grew up together and we, we even went in the Coast Guard together where I had him doing all these extra duty. I got him in trouble a lot. Me and Danny Sternberg got him in trouble a lot. And so he's announcing the National Honor Society and he said, and the next honoree is Robin Goldman. He says, just a minute, are you in a relation to Marty Goldman? And in her little squeaky voice, she said, yes. She says, there's no way that a National, National Honor Society person could come from his loins. <laughs> that's, that's my Tommy Dunning and, and Robin fa favorite story. Marty, tell, tell us your Max story. Well, Max has so many stories. And to, to read the book, you're going to get into them because Max and I shared adventures together. And, and he would be 
me cloned over. He would just invent things to do and to say and get people involved. But we were watching a show called Stand By Me, and it, it was a comedy. And one of the scenes was there was a, a cherry pie eating contest. And this guy had given himself something to make him nauseous. And, he, and during the pie eating contest, he got sick. And everybody that was around him got sick. All the judges got sick. And they were all letting it go. And here I was, I had a mouthful of popcorn and I had a Coke in my mouth. And it was so funny, I started laughing and I spit it out and I spit it on the, on the lady's head in front of me. I grabbed Max and I pulled him out of there and said, we gotta go, Max. He says, where are we going? This is a great show, this is a great scene. I said, I gotta go to the bathroom, Max. He said, I don't have to go. I said, Max, you're out of here. I yanked him by his arm, took him in there and I told him what happened. I spit that Coke and, and popcorn all over that lady's hair. I said, and we're not going back to those seats. <laughs> oh my God. Martin, um, one of your children asked, uh, calling in, want to know who your favorite child is. Uh, who my favorite child was? Yes. Ah, uh, exactly. That's what I told him. And the other question was, who is the best receiver you ever had when you were quarterback? Well, I must admit, it matters in what league I was playing in. In the Dallas City Leagues, there was a guy named Art Adams. Uh, is he Jewish? JCC, it could have been Louis Weig. There you go. Hello, Louis. Congratulations. Uh, you get a big prize. Marty, I always remember you telling me a story about Alan Postel. Uh, Alan moved into your neighborhood, and his mother told you to go out and uh, play with the kids and meet somebody. It was really important for her that he find a mentor. So he's out there playing with some buddies over Preston Island Park and he's there and he sees you and he sees you chasing some girl. Finally, you grab her and give her a big kiss. Immediately he turns around, runs home, says, mom, I found my mentor. <laughs> well, well, when uh, you, uh, those when, were some fun, fun times. When you read the article, Alan tells that story a little bit different, but it's close. Very close, good. Well, parts that we can't say on national television. Right. Martin, we're going to move on to college. Uh, uh, I'll tell one story about, about Mrs. Ratner. When I was in confirmation class, our confirmation class teacher was named Mrs. Ratner. And she was, she was bigger than life. And she was a great lady. And she ended, her husband ended up being your CPA for 100 years. Right. So she grabbed me out of confirmation class. She pulled me out in the hall and she says, you know, you're disruptive. And if your mother wasn't president of the sisterhood, I would throw you out of this class. But she didn't. And I finally, finally graduated. <laughs> Crazy. I remember Eleanor. Uh, Marty, uh, you uh, went to OU uh, where you were totally very popular, of course. And immediately, you became the shortest uh, time uh, president of the Sammy Pledge class at SMU. Tell us what happened there. Well, it's, it's a short story because I was only there for two weeks. Like my son said, <laughs> my father was one of the great scholars at OU. He went there for three years and he did that without buying a book or ever going to class. I'm amazed at him. Anyway, so I didn't go to class as much, but I was having a, a great time building relationships with all of my fellow pledges. So we decided under my, under my tenure, we are gonna put some greased pigs on the second floor of the fraternity house. We didn't like the members very much, and we were really bigger than they were anyway. So we put two greased pigs on the second floor of the house. We fed them x lax and in the sinks, we put roosters and chickens and bales of hay, and they started laying eggs. It was, it was crazy. The members tried to go out of their rooms in the morning and the pigs turned wild and attacked our members. We, people don't realize that, but a pig can walk upstairs, but they can't walk downstairs. So they couldn't escape. So the bottom line was the farmer that we bought the grease pigs from had to come to the house and get the pigs and rescue our members. So the, our pledge class trainer said, Goldman, you got two choices. You can either resign from Sigma Alpha Mu or you can resign as president of this pledge class. 
I said, I think I'll resign as president of the pledge class. So that's what happened. Tell us about uh, your story with uh, Hearts Mountain Birdseed. Well, I know Bruce Strongwater. His name is Strenzenwasser. He was my roommate in college. And when I first got to college, I was told that there was three women for every man. Well, Bruce had six because I didn't have any. <laughs> but he was my roommate in college. And I, I wanted Bruce to suffer a little bit. I told Bruce, I said, Bruce, if you can eat a box of this Heart Mountain bird seed in 20 minutes without drinking water, I'm going to give you $50. He said, it's a deal. So he gets onto that bird seed. He starts throwing it down his mouth and he's gone. He's got about half of it down. And finally, his eyes go wide open and, and he can't, can't breathe. And he runs, he spits, he goes into the bathroom. He starts drinking water and drinking water. Oh, he's finally got his breath back. What he didn't realize when that bird seed hit that water in his stomach, it expanded his stomach and he, he went through another hour of just pure misery, but I was highly entertained that day. That's hilarious. Um, I'm gonna watch what I eat from now on with you. Uh, tell us, you got into some kind of a fight when you were in school. Well, that's, a, that's another fairly long story um, in the book. Um, there was a friend of mine who got into a fight with some Norman punks and they attacked him and he was a pretty big boy. He was an all American, a high school football player, and he was also a wrestler. He was plenty tough himself, but he's coming back to fraternity house because they jumped him, and he wanted a couple of guys to go with him to find these guys. So he found me, and he was looking for another guy named Mike Dick, who was a <laughs> big guy, but he had a date with Buana Makuba. And so he took me and two other guys that were useless in a fight, and uh, we followed, we found the car, we found it, we pulled into the place, and it was a trap. They pulled behind us and blocked us. And that, and the story's in the book. Bottom line is somebody stabbed him in the back with a knife. I hit the guy, um, sent, sent him to the emergency room. Uh, apparently hurt him pretty bad, but the guys chased me with knives and I just started chasing them. I, it didn't bother me. I was, I had gone berserk. So the police came to get me at the fraternity house and said, who in this house is named Marty? And I said, that's me. I said, you're gonna have to come with us you put somebody in the hospital. And so Pete Ryan walked up to him and said, well, what, you wanna know why? And he pulled up his back and there was this knife wound in his back. And the policemen started huddling with one another. Well, we didn't know that, but we don't think you ought to go back to that drive-in ever again. So they let me go. <laughs> Marty, all your college buddies continue to love you to this day. And you retain that unbelievable relationship. Remember guys, we're talking about Marty's book, The Three-Year Weekend. And uh, you can buy this book uh, through the J and all the proceeds are going to charity. So it's very important that you do so. Martin, let's talk about travel. Uh, you know, you and Susan love to travel and have traveled a lot with Jackie and me and others. Uh, plus, you were always setting up golfing events, uh, fishing events, trip, trips with your friends, uh, at least once a year. Uh, we would like you to share some of the stories from those trips. Uh, you can talk about backgammon for the first one. Well, backgammon would be a highlight because Ray Garfield and I used to play for money in backgammon. And Ron Foxman said that he was a great backgammon player. He couldn't play, he couldn't play a squat. So the bottom line was we're playing and he sees us throwing $100 a point out there and we're paying each other $100 when we win a game. And Ron's saying, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? I, don't, I didn't even bring enough money for this event. Bottom line was, we said, Ron, it's only a dollar. He said, oh, my God, that's too much, too. So he didn't ever play us for money. Hey, Marty, can I tell a story about Billy Joel at Barton Creek? you got to tell two stories if you're going to tell that one. All right, fine. Well, the first story is about Billy Joel. Uh, every time I went with Marty, whenever there was a piano involved, I'd always try to grab the piano and start playing songs, singing Billy Joel, Carole King, James Taylor. I was terrible. Piano was terrible. But we had a lot of fun. So we're at Barton Creek, and some lady comes up and drops a $5 bill in the cup on the piano. And I'm thinking, what is that? I said, thank you very much. And I keep playing, play a little more. Some other guy comes up and drops a 10 in. 
and I'm feeling pretty stout now. I must be really having some fun. So I keep playing, somebody drops a 20, and I say, my God, I must really be doing some good here. So I'm playing, and finally Marty walks up, sticks his hand in the jar and says, oh, it's time to go eat dinner. I better take my money. Marty had put them all up to bringing that money up to me, making me up and then dropping me down. Marty, can't, can't believe he did that. We have another story uh, while on that same trip where we were uh, really hungry and right across from Barton Creek, if you recall, is a restaurant called the County Line. So we went to get in line at the County Line and it was too long of a wait. So we drove all the way around over to 2222 to go to the other County Line. And we get in line there and uh, it's an hour and 30 minute wait. So one of the guys that's with us says, hey, I got this. And so he walks up to the hostess and says, my name is so-and-so. I'm the president of a national chain of uh, restaurants. Hands her his card. It's common courtesy when an executive from a national chain comes to a restaurant that you allow him to be seated in front of all the other people. May I see your uh, manager? So the guy said, the lady says, sure. A couple minutes later, the manager comes up looking at his card and says, hello, Mr. So-and-so. How may I help you? So he tells the same story. He says, well, the manager looks at it and says, uh, I used to work for you, and you fired me three years ago. It'll be an hour and a half wait. So <laughs> I was really embarrassed. And so uh, we decided we were starving. We went ahead, went to the back of the line and waited. But Marty stayed up by the podium because, Marty, you tell the rest of the story. Well, the bottom line was that uh, people, it was, it was way, way over a two-hour wait at one time. People just got tired of waiting because it was probably 9.30 by then or 10 o'clock and I was gonna eat some barbecue. And so the lady comes up and she says, Evan Woods, party of four, your table's ready. Evan Woods, party of four, your table's ready. Finally, after a, two or three minutes, she said, last call for Evan Woods, party of four. I said, did you say Evan Woods? She said, yes. I said, we're right here, come on. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. And she went and sat us right there. We waited three minutes, probably. And we sat there with, with table tents, or rather the menus in front of our face, because we were laughing so hard that we didn't want the manager to see that we got seated right away. So, Steve, I hope I didn't take too much of your thunder. Oh, Marty, that's just a great story. I'll never forget, never forget Evan Woods. Marty, tell us about uh, Padre lunch with seafood oh my goodness well i gotta tell one on my buddy then uh mel platt and ron foxman because they're, they're the easiest ones to tell stuff on because um they're just easy to tell stuff on we had just had a big day of fishing there was jeff and ron and mel and we, we go fishing at least once a year sometimes twice a year together and we, sometimes we take our children our sons but the bottom line is we always catch a lot of fish at South Padre. I've got some really good guides there that I've been using for years and we catch our limit. So we're loaded with fish. We take it back to the restaurant and we ask them to, to fry it or blacken it or grill it. And then we order every side dish they've got there. If you've ever eaten with Foxman, you know that you're gonna order some side dishes. Sure enough, we've got a lot of food left over. And I looked at this table over there I said, you, you fellas mind if I give some of this away? And I walk over to the table and I'm sitting there for a little while. Mm -hmm. I come back and I said to the boys, I said, you, re you realize those are Israelis over there? They're speaking Hebrew. And, and here's Mel Platt says, you know, that makes sense. You know, there's a Chabad house just right over here. And all the Israelis, they own all the t-shirt companies and, the, and all these things. That makes sense. And those are all Israelis, huh? Yep, all of them, and, they, and Foxman and him are asking me questions. I'm just going on and on, and I'm just, a, and finally, Jeff can't stand it anymore. He says, do you guys believe that for one second? He said, this is Shabbat. You think those Chabadniks would be eating Mexican food on, on the Shabbat? <laughs> so they got a big kick out of it. And Mel says, well, who are they? I said, they're four construction workers that are working next door. That's who they are. <laughs> oh, my. Marty, one more Padre story. Tell us about what you did to Big Al, a blessed memory. Well, that really didn't turn out to be in, in uh, South Padre. Jeff, I think that was in uh, Aranzas Pass. 
think it was Aransas Pass. And so there's 24 of us, father and sons, and we go to uh, one of the famous restaurants there to get, to get a private room for that many people. We had to make a reservation and we get there and uh, a lady walks up to Big Al, who I might say that when he, when, when he passed away, the family asked me to give this, this speech or this story. And I told this story when he passed away. The lady comes up to him and says, do I know you? Al says, I don't think so. I've never been here before. She says, well, you sure look familiar. She comes back a few minutes with some appetizers and drinks. She says, I know where I saw you. You're Big Al. You're Big Al's from, from, from Big Al's restaurant in Dallas, Texas. You were written up as the best barbecue in Dallas. And she, uh, she went on and on. And Al's going crazy. He says, look at that. People are recognizing me. They all, they all know it's me, this lady out of the clear blue. She knows I'm from Big Al's. And everybody at the table is laughing and dying. And Big Al finally says, well, what's so funny? Why is everybody laughing? And somebody says, Marty put her up to it, Al. <laughs> Body funny at the time, boys and girls. So, Marty, remembering the Big Al story uh, moves me to talk about your favorite pastime, which is eating. And uh, always, uh, you were the guy that ordered food. Um, I remember uh, one trip you said that uh, anybody has a 32 inch waist, obviously doesn't know how to eat, so you're right. not allowed to order. <laughs> that was in uh, Palm Springs. Uh, right. But your favorite food, Marty, is barbecue. Give us a couple of barbecue adventures. Give you a couple of barbecue stories. And I, I know that the Colons are on the line, they're watching this, but I, but I uh, the hardest ticket to get into really in the country at one time was no, no reservations, was it Franklin's Barbecue. And I called up Aaron Franklin. I said, Aaron, I'm going to be there Saturday, and I'd like to come in and get some barbecue, and I'll come in as early as you want me to. He says, Martin, if you're here at 1015, we're not open until 11. You get here at 1015, I'll have your barbecue for you. And so there's a line of maybe 200 yards. Kids are selling chairs out there for you to wait to get in. And we walk out of there. I don't know who walks with Oh, Ron walks in with me, and we take out these these uh, boxes of barbecue for our group. In fact, my son met us at the park and uh, it was a thrill to have Franklin's barbecue and all those people staring at us when we were walking out of there. Another- Tell, tell, us, tell us about Chinese barbecue. You want the Chinese barbecue? Yes, right. sir. Chinese barbecue. Um, there's a place called First China Barbecue on uh, Polk and Greenville Avenue. And I told uh, David Rep. <laughs> me there for lunch I'm going to give you a great experience and uh, so he got there we got there I said and this is what I think we should order and I told him everything we should order and the lady came over to the table and I started speaking Chinese to her and I go on and on Kung Pao hua, hi -ha. and David Rep says I cannot believe Martin actually knows Chinese I said no this is Mandarin. You have to know how to speak Mandarin. And we go on and on. The Finally, the, the order gets there, and it's exactly what I said we wanted. And they were amazed. But they didn't know that I had gotten there 20 minutes early and filled out the, of everything that I wanted. They really couldn't speak English too well, but I filled out everything that they wanted. So they thought I was brilliant. Uh, Marty, uh, I, I know we're going to be we're going to be running short of time, but I, I want I want to tell at least two more stories. I want to tell the story about Ray Garfield and the go-karts. And so Ray Garfield and I compete with each other. We traveled with our wives together. We're at South Padre Island and there's a go-kart place. And, uh, and I get up to the starter and I give him $10 and I said, whatever happens, I want to go faster than that schmuck over there. Guy takes my $10 and I'm getting ready to go on my go-kart. And all of a sudden, he goes and gets Ray going, and we start going, and Ray keeps lapping me. He's going faster than me. I'm thinking, I must be so heavy that he, 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 well, the bottom line is, Ray gave him $20 to go faster. <laughs> Marty, tell us about your grandkids. Uh, about who? Your grandchildren. Give us a quick update on your grandchildren. 
My grandchildren? Yes. I, when, when I'm taking them on a cruise, they sure want to be with me. I know that. Um, I've got four granddaughters and they just are so special to me. And um, what can I tell you? They're just the most special. Uh, Tatum and Riley and Haley and Zoe and um, they're a blessing to be with, but I was going to hold that off till the last of it. I'm sorry. Can I tell a couple more quick stories? Yeah, let me let me ask you about uh, uh, a story about Oren Dreven and Highland Park High School. Oren Dreven played for the B team at Highland Park Junior High. He could have been the positively worst athlete on the team. So Alan and I, Alan's his older brother, Alan Dreben, and we go and sit in the very back of Highlander Stadium, and it is freezing out there. But we go to the very back where there's the press box has actually got a heater in there. So the game starts, and the first play of the game, I said, I don't know what I said. I said, nice tackle, Dreben. The press box announcer, tackle by Dreben. I said, Alan, this is fun. The next play comes along, and I said, oh, great tackle, Dreven. The press box announcer, he's never done a press box announce before, said, tackle by Dreven. This goes on and on. Finally, the end of the game, we're ready to go, and Dreven is not even in the game. And I said, oh, tackle by Dreven again. And the press box announcer says, you're not going to believe it, but another tackle by Dreben. He wasn't even in the game. So that was a great story for Alan and I that day. That's, a, that's a, my favorite. Marty, uh, tell us about someone buying dinner for you at Sue's. Well, I'm with uh, Mel and Jody Platt, and we had just come back from uh, Australia, and we bought a bottle of Pinfold Grange. It's a pretty expensive bottle of wine. We weren't going to share it with anybody, but we, but they allow you to bring in your own wine. And so we're having the most fabulous dinner there, drinking this pinfold, this expensive wine. And the waitress comes up and she says, which one of you is Dr. Platt? Mel says, well, I'm Dr. Platt. Well, Dr. Platt, somebody just left here and they don't want to be recognized, but they said you saved his life on a heart procedure and they bought your dinner for you. And man, Mel, he was hook, line, and sinker. Mel was all over this. God bless. I wish I could thank the guy who, who, who I saved his life and he would do this. This was the greatest. Finally, I said, Mel, nobody bought that dinner. I bought that dinner. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's the one I got on old Mel. I love that. Uh, Marty, uh, one more quick question about uh, food. You know, with food comes drink, and you were a major wholesale uh, spirits distributorship years ago. You have any drinking stories? Well, on our one of our father son fishing trip, um, my son would bring all the liquor, and he would bring some really really fine liquor. And one of the items that he brought, besides he brought some good stuff, but he bought this one right here. It's called Blanton. And if David Friedman's watching, he'll see that there's an ounce left in here. So the bottom line was we're drinking and every time David goes up to the bar, there's one ounce left in the bottle and he thinks he's getting the last ounce, but he's had so much to drink that, that night. He doesn't know one ounce for another. So the next day we're leaving to go back to Dallas. I said, David, have I messed with you at all this weekend? He said, Nope, you didn't mess with me one time. I said, yes, I did. I kept filling up that Blanton bottle with Jim Beam every other minute, and you just kept drinking it. So that's, that's my one liquor story. I, I know it. there's a lady in Repka who is, is on the line because I saw her earlier. I got to tell my Lynn Repka story because she would pull it on me. My mother was treated so well by Lynn and Helene and Joyce, the ladies at our company. And once every quarter or so, I would take them to Paul's Porterhouse on uh, Composition, which was near our office. <clears throat> and I would always buy the girls lunch. My sister would go, my mother would go, and several of the ladies from the office. 
and I, the check comes and I give the lady my credit card and she comes back and she says, I'm sorry, sir, but there's insufficient funds. This credit card is no good. I said, what? What do you mean it's no good? I'm sorry, sir, it's no good. I take out another credit card and I give it to her. I said, all right, try this one. She comes back and she says, sir, I'm sorry, it's insufficient funds again. I said, what has Susan been doing? She'd been shopping up a storm. Well, the girls couldn't stop laughing. They had, they had told the, the waitress to say that. And of course the credit cards were good, but they had a big laugh on me. And so Lynn, thank you. Thank you for being such the greatest for me in all those years. And I know you love Gladys and that meant a lot to me. She's a sweetheart. Martin, um, we have uh, more stories later if we have a little more time, but I know part of your leadership has been to train some of the people out there who um, have uh, done great jobs in the community. And uh, one of them is a story about having Kenny Goldberg or training Kenny Goldberg to be a great solicitor. Why don't you share that? All right, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you reminded me of that. That happens to be one of my, my proudest memories. Kenny Goldberg and Mike Hirsch and Jeff Seymour and Toby Gerber and Stuart Prescott and Ann Stern all came under my watch. So when I was president, they all came behind me. But Kenny was not a fundraiser in those days. And I said, come on, Kenny, we got to raise some money for the J. So I took him into a dugout at the baseball game. We stopped the game and we went to the dugout and I said, we got to raise some money for the J. Going to have to help us out here. Everybody in the dugout gave us money. Kenny says, oh, this is unbelievable. I can't believe we're doing this. We go to the next dugout, which is across the field. We did the same thing. We stopped the game. I go into the dugout with Kenny and we start raising money. I said, well, Kenny, did you learn anything about fundraising today? He says, Martin, I learned that they would have given you anything to continue that game. <laughs> so that's exactly what happened. And then Kenny came, I don't have to tell you, a monster in the community. So proud of he and Sherry for all they've done. Marty, um, one of the most enjoyable activities I've ever participated with you in called Elevator Stories. There are a bunch of elevator stories in the book. Would you explain the elevator stories to us and share a couple? Well, I'd like you to share your favorite story, but the elevator stories basically, we were in a 17 story building and I was usually with somebody like Steve or Scott Cohen or Michael Wallman or um, Todd Shannon or Tom Callanan. And we got on the, the bottom floor to go up with the elevator. I would, I would say something to one of them and you had to be on your toes because I was gonna start you out and you had to follow through and get, get, get to the story. So that's the fun of it. But one, the one that I have about Michael Wallman we got on the bottom floor there and I said, Michael, how's that, how's that uh, rash doing? Michael said, oh, I'm contagious. I've got the rash. I took it home to my wife last night. Now she's got the rash. On the next floor, the entire <laughs> elevator emptied. <laughs> it was, to, to, to entertain ourselves was just too much fun. A story that you might share. What about, before we do, tell us one about uh, you and Tom. Tom was great at this. Tom Callanan, who was great at it. Tom and I had a shtick going and we would do it in restaurants. We'd, wherever we went to lunch, we'd come back with a famous, a funny story. Or like, have you ever eaten iguana before? That was the first time I'd ever had it. Or, or I, said to, I said to Tom, I said, Tom, have you ever seen a rat that big run across a restaurant? Tom would go on and on. No, that's a first for me. And can you believe the manager didn't do anything? He just let the rat run around. And we got to the top floor and everybody was still on the elevator. Nobody left. They all wanted to see or hear what restaurant we went to, but we never would tell them. And we got off and then we just started laughing as we, we got them. And then we ever got anybody to talk on the rest on the elevator, that was a plus. That, that, I, that's some of my fondest memories. Martin, uh, tell us this. Uh, you were a, uh, always a great athlete. And I know you've come up against some great athletes. I remember hearing a story 
uh, about you coming up with that great athlete, Dr. Steve Levy, in some sport. I can't remember what it was. Do you, do you remember what that was? That was the low life of my life. <laughs> Positively the low life. Steve Levy beat me in ping pong. Oh, my God. A thousand games, and he beat me in ping pong. I'm so sorry. For somebody George, George Geo just writes in, he wants to know why you stopped calling him to play in some of your football games. Well, first of all, you got to know George Geo. George played center linebacker for Tulane University, and he thought himself to be one of the great athletes of New Orleans. And uh, I asked him to go play doubles with us. So he went to play doubles with us. And we're into this match maybe 20 minutes. And he he pulls his hamstring. Now, you don't pull your hamstring in tennis that often, but he did. And to make matters worse, about a year later, I asked him to come out and play on Thanksgiving Day. We played football. Stallback had a team. I had a team. We'd play each other on Thanksgiving Day. George goes out for a pass and pulls a hamstring. And in the, and in the letter he wrote to me, he says, you know, Martin never asked me to ever join him again for anything. So that was my George Geo story. Martin, I just got a note from the head frauder of ZBT National, wanting to know how you got Max Goldman to go to ZBT. Well, Max had told us that he was not going to join a Jewish fraternity. He was going to join one that his friends were going to. And I said, well, that's okay, Max. You join whatever you want to. But I'm going to tell you something. Once a month, I'm going to send that check to ZBT. You join wherever you want to, but the check isn't going there. Well, Max had already worked out with Susan. He said, I'm going to join it. I'm going to join it, but I'm going to give Dad a hard time on the way. And he did, and I, but I meant every word of it, too. Martin, uh, we know, remind everybody about your book, The Three-Year Weekend, the fabulous book you could buy through the JCC. Cost us thirty dollars, and the money goes to charity. Uh, yeah. There's another uh, question I'd like to ask you in the book, Marty. Who is this guy on page five? This big tall guy. His name is Jack Ehrlich. He is from El Paso, Texas. If you guys can see this, he was the tallest man in the world, and he worked for the Roma Wine Company. And before he passed away, at I think forty-six years old, he was a wonderful friend of ours. He used to come to Dallas selling Roma wine. And my, my mother, Olga Sholem, may she rest in peace, would make him potato latkes. And I remember him, me sitting on his knee and he'd take a, a half a dollar and put the half a dollar through his ring finger. I thought that was pretty cool at the time. Pretty cool. All right, Martin, one more story. Uh, I'd like to hear, if you don't mind, about uh, Madame Trousseau. Well, I hope, Jar I hope Chuck Jarvie's on the line because Madame Trousseau was a highlight of my pulling a trick on somebody else's career. Chuck was president of uh, Shinley, which was one of the companies that we represented and really the largest company that I represented. And Chuck was also past president of Dr. Pepper. But he and I and our wives were really friendly together. And I won a trip to go over on the QE2 ship and fly back on the Concord. And so it was a really thrill to win these kind of a trip. So Chuck and I and the wives would separate from everybody else. We go do our own thing. So we go to Madame Trousseau's, the House of Wax, and the last thing in there is the Chamber of Horrors. Horrors. There's Jack the Ripper. There's Frankenstein. There's the vampire. There's the werewolf. And so, I'm looking around, nobody's there but Chuck and I, and I go up on the, on the little, little stage and I put on a menacing grin like this. Uh, uh, and I just am silent like everybody else up there. These two little old ladies are walking through and they're looking at the, the House of Horrors. And I went, mmm, mmm. And they drop their purses and they run out of there. And I look down and here's Chuck Jarvie He's on his hands and knees. He can't catch his breath. He's laughing so hard. 
and uh, it was a it was a great story. I don't know if they ever came back for their pur for their purses, but we got the heck out of there pretty quick. Martin, you're too much. Your kids want to hear the story about Coast Guard regurgitating. They really want to hear that story. I don't know. Is it is it PG? No, it's not PG. But it it was um, it was uh, we were on a fire drill and we were all on a Coast Guard team and we had a a breathing apparatus that we didn't have working, no oxygen coming out because it was just a drill. And they closed all the galley windows and the food was all in there. And the smell from the galley was horrible. So we were on this fire drill and we were getting sicker and sicker being in these masks, smelling all these fumes. And I'm the one that started it. Buck Mahaney looked at me, I looked at him and I filled up the mask. Yeah. So he filled up the mask and we abandoned the fire drill. Everybody threw their mask down and we all went to the head and we were laughing and throwing up in the toilets all at the same time. Oh, it was pretty comical at, at that time. Martin, you've been a fabulous uh, guest for the JCC. Uh, I can't tell you how much uh, we appreciate this. Why don't you give your last few comments? Hey, Jeff. Open it. You want, you want me to make the last few comments? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, I want to... First of all, thank all those that are involved in this process, how much I appreciate it. And I want to thank my wife for putting up with it. And every time she'd read the book, she would start laughing at some of the things that were going on. And it means a lot to me to have the support from, from her and the children and, and the stories that they gave me and from all my friends that turned in some stories and, uh, I just can't tell you how, how important it is for me. Susan and I are watching a movie last night and it's called uh, Fried Green Tomatoes. And one of the last lines in the show was, the old lady says to the younger, Kathy Bates, she says, really the most important thing in life is friendship. So Jeff, you got my, you got my whiskey ready? Yeah, just pull it back. <laughs> tell you that, uh, I'd like to thank all my friends and family for their friendship. And you know, when I say this, I love each and every one of you, and you're so special to me. And I say to the J, L'chaim. L'chaim. Martin, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. This is fabulous. Back to you, Ron. Thanks, to everyone, for joining uh, the program tonight. Martin is just one of um, many famous authors that are going to be featured on Book Fest this season. The, the J will host more than 30 authors uh, between now and December. Coming soon are Al Roker on August 18, uh, John Meacham on September 2, Harlan Coben in October, and N Nathan Sharansky in November. So check out the J website and uh, get in touch with Adina and Rochelle. And, and again, thanks to Adina and Rochelle. They, they did a fantastic job uh, staffing this event tonight. And uh, we hope to see you on Zoom soon. Good night and thanks again for Zooming in and supporting the J. Thank you. Good night. Great job, everyone.